Okay, well, I can at least start to, uh, to recap, and anyone who trickles in will hopefully trickle in before we roll into the new stuff here. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and pray, and then we'll, we'll get started. So, God, thank you that we can do this. Um, it's, it's such a pleasure every time to be able to study your word and learn more about you. Father, I pray that you would uh, you'd bless our time here, mm-hmm. that it would be uh, an enjoyable experience from beginning to end, and that you would teach us, Father. You'd help us to learn, help us to understand, help us to discuss and, and uh, seek deeper understanding of you and your ways uh, tonight. And I pray that everything we do would be focused on that end. We love you, Father. Amen. Amen. Okay, so we've been in Galatians for a while now. This is uh, week four, I think. Wow. Week four. Yeah, and so we actually have not even tested, touched a single verse in Galatians yet. We've been doing a whole lot of preliminary backup uh, outside work. Mm-hmm. But we finally finished last week. We finally finished looking at all the background information that we need to understand before we can go into the book. And I, I did say this a few times uh, last week and the week before. But Galatians, uh, occasionally you'll find books in the Bible that require a huge amount of background study before you can really have a lot of hope of understanding what's going on. Galatians is definitely one of them. It's right near the top of the list where there's very specific things happening in history that uh, Galatians is a response to. And so unless we have a solid understanding of what is going on, what the event is, and uh, the ramifications of that event, and so on and so forth, we're not going to really be able to get the message of the book, get what God is trying to communicate to us through the book. So we're, we're finally done with that. And just to recap here, I left this up. Um, somebody give me like a one line recap of why Galatians was written. Because people are trying to stick to the old rules in places where it's kind of messing it up for everybody. Yeah, I think that's a good way of putting it. Um, Remember, Galatians is a letter written by a guy named Paul, who was kind of one of the first really big missionaries in the history of the church. Um, It was written to the churches in Galatia, which were primarily not Jewish, or primarily Gentile Christians, this whole new movement. And it was written because there were people coming to these Gentile Christians and telling them to do things that Paul did not tell them to do. Here are things that are important. Paul didn't tell you this because this, he's, you know, he didn't know it. So now we're going to fill you in on more important things. And the bottom line is, I left all this stuff up here because it was uh, it's kind of a summary scale. The big issue in the church, and this will just take a minute to recap. The big issue in the early church was, okay, it had always been Jews. Jews are the people of God. And the people of God were always circumcised. And they always followed the certain dietary restrictions. And they always celebrated certain uh, holidays and so on and so forth. And that's what made them the people of God. And so now we have this Christian movement going into the Gentiles. And so how many of the laws should the Gentiles have to obey? You know, obviously the moral laws are important. Don't murder or steal or kill or so on and so forth. But should they all have to be circumcised? Should they all have to follow the Old Testament diet and have to observe all of the holidays and ceremonies and the Jewish calendar, all that kind of thing. What should they have to do and what shouldn't they have to do? And so you had a lot of debate here. We had, you know, way over here, we have the, you know, the liberal party represented by Peter saying, okay, circumcision is not that important. This stuff is not that important. The middle party saying, okay, well, no, it's not necessary for salvation, but it's part of our heritage, so we should respect it. And then we have the, the Pharisees, the conservatives, or the circumcision party, saying, well, f- at the very least, circumcision is necessary. Maybe the other stuff not so much, but circumcision is necessary. And then way over here, we have the Judaizers, who are essentially trying to make Christianity into well, Judaism. Mm-hmm. Everything is the same. All of the practices are exactly the same. It's just we're Judaizing Christianity. So you had to have the circumcision. You had to follow the diet. You had to obey all of the, you know, the holidays and the ceremonies and the festivals and so on and so forth. And then way over here, we had Paul, the Faith and Liberty Party, because he cared about relationship with God and walking in faith with Jesus Christ. And he said circumcision is not necessary. It's an outward action, and what matters is the inward action. That stuff was important in the past to differentiate you from other people groups, but it's not anymore. Um, and then we don't have to worry about these guys for now anyways. 
But that is, that is the big debate. And you had these guys right here, the Judaizers, showing up to the Galatian churches and saying, well, wait a minute, you're not circumcised? Well, I can't believe Paul didn't tell you about this. That's really important. You can't be saved. You can't have Christianity. You can't know Jesus unless you're circumcised and unless you follow the diet and unless you obey the holidays and so on and so forth. That's what's really important. And the letter to the Galatians is Paul's response to that. It is directly a response because the Galatians were hearing this and they were believing it. They were, okay, I guess we should do this stuff. They were following it. And Paul writes in a very strongly worded letter saying, I can't believe you're turning away from this. I can't believe you're turning away so quickly from what I just taught you. Like months or even like within a year after he had left them and founded those churches. So that is a, that is a really quick summary of what we've been talking about in the last few weeks. And that is why Galatians is written. That is the purpose. And that is what he's trying to accomplish. Paul in this letter is trying to disprove the Judaizers' argument. And he's trying to point the Galatians to the purpose of the law. And the things that are really important. Because obviously the law is important, right? I mean, thou shalt not kill. That is pretty universally a good idea. You shouldn't kill a person. You shouldn't murder a person at the very least. You shouldn't be stealing. You shouldn't be lying, so on and so forth. Those are good things, but what about the other laws? What is really important? And what is the law in general? How much of it should you follow? And Galatians comes out of Paul's desire to give them an idea, the purpose of the law, in this new thing they're doing called Christianity. There's a place for it, but where is that place? So that is Galatians, guys. And today we actually get to go into the book, finally. We're taking the training wheels off. Um, I have extra Bibles for any of you who want to be reading along. <laughs> and if you'd rather, I am also going to have it up here on the screen. So we can all be looking at it and reading together. The format is going to be really, really simple. I am simply starting on chapter one. And we are going to read verse by verse and explain it all. Cool. Saying, here's what he says. What does it mean? And we can talk back and forth. And come to a conclusion, okay, that's what he's saying. Sometimes we'll hit a section where we go, that is really straightforward. And other times we'll hit a section where we go, what in the world is he talking about? But in general, because we have the background information, we should, in most cases, go, oh, that's exactly what he's saying. I mean, he's talking about this. He's talking about this problem. Whereas a lot of people have trouble with Galatians because they'll come into it not knowing what he's talking about. And they'll make all kinds of crazy guesses and assumptions as to what he's saying or what he's referring to. And it leads to all kinds of trouble. So we're in, we're in a good position. Does anybody want any of the Bibles that I happen to have on hand? Good. Okay. No cell phones allowed. I don't believe in technology. That's a joke. I was, I mean, <laughs> literally, I, I never use those. I'm always on my computer. <laughs> you guys really... <laughs> oh no! Right, right. Yeah. Like a tablet and the television. And... Okay. Um, are you guys ready? Yes. Any questions before we go in? Anything we need to a refresher on or whatever else? Okay. Uh, what I'm gonna do really quickly. You okay if I erase this? No. You're not okay. No, I'm I'm fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> are you guys all right if I erase this? Okay. I don't want to, but it's big. Mm -hmm. It's large. So I'm going to get rid of it. What I'm going to do is give you a really quick overview of the book. In terms of breaking down the chapters and the verses and so on and so forth. Okay? And then we'll go into the verses. And... Uh, first section, I'll just number them off, is chapter 1, verses 1 through 9. And very simply, this is Paul's opener. It's his opening statements. One through nine, he is opening. He is introducing himself, and he's introducing the purpose of his letter. The second major section is uh, chapter one, starting in verse 10, all the way to the end of chapter two. And that'll bring us, you know, that brings us, uh, it's six chapters, by the way. So this brings us a third through the book, and this, uh, this is the first major section, the first point we get started getting into the meat. 
And this is Paul's defense of his gospel, his gospel, of the gospel that he preached to them. And this is good to like to keep in mind. And I'll leave this up there as long as I can, but you know, I may have to erase it eventually. The third major section. I always end up missing a verse. I don't miss this. Uh, from the beginning of chapter three, three verse one, to chapter four, verse seven, and we can call this. Um, Paul making an argument against the uh, twisted gospel. And then for the true gospel. And, uh, well, I think we've got two more, well, three more sections, I thought we were going to be uh, Section four is from uh, verse four, or chapter four, verse eight, to chapter five, verse 12. And this is a personal appeal. Fresh year. He's opening. He's giving a defense of the gospel that he gave them. He's giving an argument against the gospel that they were presented by the Judaizers. And then he's giving them a personal appeal to choose the freedom of the true gospel as opposed to the slavery of the gospel that was presented to them by the Judaizers. And then five, running out of room already, <laughs> is chapter five, verse 13. To chapter 6, verse 10. And this we can call a practical appeal. He's showing them, okay, here's why you should. Here's why it's better. Here's why the true gospel offers you legitimate, uh, meaningful life, whereas the twisted gospel is no good for you. And then finally, the last little section, which isn't really much of a section at all, 11 through 18. This is just what you call the postscript. The postscript, where he's kind of wrapping things up. So this is the book. And, well, we'll see how far we get today. But that is the book. Any questions before we get started? in section one with the opener. No? Okay. Here we go. Uh, by the way, I am using the English Standard Version yeah. translation. Um, you can use whatever version you want, but I recommend for our purposes the ESV or the NASB. <clears throat> but it's not going to it's not going to kill you if you're using a different one. But in, in general, uh, in terms of accuracy to the Greek, ESV or NASB are what I mostly recommend. Okay, here we go. Paul starts off, and this is right at the beginning of the letter. This is it. They are picking up the letter, and this is what they read. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who are with me to the churches of Galatia. Now, immediately you're going to see Paul's tendency, which is to dashes and commas and parentheses. I mean, any of those you see are the translator's desperate attempts at making his sentence make sense. Because Paul just like, he goes on and on and on and he'll hit a rabbit trail. Because by the way, if you cut this whole thing out, that section, from that dash to that dash, it would be, he, Paul an apostle and the brothers are with me to the churches of Galatia. This is, a, this is a rabbit trail. He decided, Paul is with me. By the way, I'm not an apostle from men or through men, but through Jesus Christ, through God the Father. 
and God the Father, who raised Jesus Christ from the dead. So you see he's going all over the place. And this is, this is one of the reasons why people get really confused really quick when they're reading Paul, because he does that. Um, you, you ever listen to a speaker, and you're like, you're following him, and then suddenly you, you, you consciously recognize that he said something, and then got interested in his own head about the thing he said, and then rabbit trailed into the thing off of the main point? You ever, have you ever made that conscious? Uh, as a speaker, I see it all the time, and it's like my, one of my biggest pet peeves I have. Come, come on, stay on point. Um, but yeah, this is, this is Paul, guys. And what's cool is, just like a lot of speakers who do that, you'll often get incredible nuggets of truth from those, um, uh, from those tangents. But they're tangents, all the same. They're definitely tangents. And he says, Paul, an apostle, and all the brothers who are with me, all the, the people who are ministering with me, and I'm writing to you guys, the churches in Galatia. Um, any thoughts or questions about that, though, these first two verses? There's not a whole lot that we need to digest or get really confused about. Do you guys know why all punctuation is the word for copy editors? <laughs> yeah, because in the Greek... You just see Paulos, Ana, Apostolos, blah, 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 There is no comma or period or anything. Just a giant wall of text. And it's really intimidating trying to translate this guy. Let me see. You and I both translated Colossians. I translated the first chapter of Colossians, which took just so long. So long. The guy's a the guy's a crazy, crazy guy. Well, that that Paul. But yeah, this is uh, you know, this first little story, this these two verses. It's 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 not too hard, not too bad. This is almost ex he starts his letters almost the exact same way every time. Paul, an apostle, and then who am I apostle from? And he likes to be very clear. I'm not going, coming from my own authority, or from the authority of other people. My authority as an apostle, as somebody who's leading the church and who's leading the, the drive of Christianity, my uh, authority comes from Jesus Christ and from God, who raised Christ from the dead. So it's an opening. This is an introduction. And I'm writing with all my brothers to the churches in Galatia. Moving on. Okay. This will be fun because, okay, there we go. Nope. Nope. Ah. Uh, to all the churches in Galatia, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father, to whom the glory be forever and ever. Amen. So, what is this? We've got three verses here. Why are they here? Yeah, he says, I'm Paul, and I'm writing to you, Galatians. Grace and peace to you. Now, I'm, I'm just going to cut out all of the stuff and tell you what he's saying. Grace and peace to you. Amen. That's basically what, he, what he's saying. Grace and peace to you, and it's from, I'm, I'm, I'm blessing you with the blessing of God, our Father, and of Jesus Christ. And by the way, Jesus Christ gave himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age, and by the way, that was according to the will of God, the Father. And by the way, we should always be giving God the Father the glory forever and ever. So you, you see the... I mean, it, it makes sense, but he's... Okay, and I want to give you grace and peace, and also from God the Father. And Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, according to the will of God. And then we should always be giving him glory forever and ever. <sighs> Amen. Okay, now I'm going to get back to... And I've made it back to my point again. So this is Paul, yes. Would he be, would he, would part of the reasoning there be um, positioning himself? Why he's the spokesman? You know, I mean, that he is speaking and bringing this to you from the God of God. Certainly, especially what we read in verses 1 through 2. Hi. I'm sorry, I'm very late. It's all right. Come on in. Sorry about that. We are in the book of, well, I need to write it down again, I erased it. 
We're in the book of Galatians, and we have just started breaking down the verses one by one and just going through. You're free to have a seat wherever you'd like. Okay, thank you. Sure. Yeah, Jim, in response to your question, um, especially with, and let me go back here. Especially with, right here, I'm an apostle, not from men, not through men, any authority, and anything I have to say right here comes from the authority given to me by Jesus Christ and from God the Father. So absolutely. And he he makes a point of this uh, quite a bit, because he he never wants to presume that he's doing this uh, of his own ability or so on and so forth. Like, hey, I have something to say to you, you should listen to me because I'm Paul and I'm so great. He always says, "I'm, I'm telling you these things. Because God has given me authority to speak into your lives and into the lives or into the life of your church, and so here's where I'm coming from. But absolutely, and that's that's a, definitely a tendency of, of Paul's to mention that. And this is kind of like hey, you know, once again, it's, it's all good stuff here, because you know, here we go, grace and peace, and then grace and peace come from God and Christ. And by the way, Christ gave Himself for our sins to deliver us from the present evil age. This is all good information. It's just maybe not how I would do it. I, I would say. Nate, to the Galatians, blessings on you. And then it would be one verse instead of five. <laughs> but this is Paul, and this is it's different styles of teaching and different styles of writing. And he was a he was a very educated man, and so he liked to be flowery in his speech and in his writing and so on and so forth. So Kenny, could you uh, pull the door too? And so well, this is the introduction. This is the intro intro. So far, we haven't gotten to anything even remotely concerned with the purpose or the meat of the book or anything else. He's just saying, I am Paul. Blessings on you. That is the boiled down version of what he just said. <laughs> I, I, I know a lot of people who will try to pick up Paul's writing. and know the first few verses are like, I don't know what he said. I'm just, who knows? You know? But uh, that's, that's what he said. He's, this is open. It's an opening line. And it's, it's straightforward. So all we have to do is just take it step by step. So by the way, uh, he says I'm an apostle. Does anyone know what apostle means? If you were to take the word literally, uh, it means something really close to one who is sent. One who is sent. And so just like you, uh, you brought up, Jim, He's saying, I am an apostle, I am one who is sent by God. And everything I do, and everything I'm trying to do for you guys, I have been sent. I am sent by God, and that is my, my purpose, that is my goal. He's a man on a mission. Um, and, you know, they're his credentials, really. He's like, okay, I'm an inspector, and here's my, you know, here are my credentials. He's really saying, I am, I'm going to speak into your lives here, and these are my credentials. Could this also have been the style of writing in those days as well? Well, uh, you, you, might, you might think that, but then you look at Peter yeah. or John or uh, a lot of other, in general, sure, but it's okay. Paul. You can definitely get a, yeah, a feel for Paul and his personality. This is his, it shows you what he's concerned about and what he likes to do and how he likes to speak and communicate, and it's Paul. Mm -hmm. There's a very distinct flavor when you're reading uh, Pauline, um, Pauline letters. And so then we, get to, then we get to verse 6. So this is just the, the introduction here. It's all good. And then verse 6 shows up, and here we start getting into the, uh, the big guns. He says, I am astonished. So he doesn't waste too much time. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. So why is he astonished? Because they turn so quickly. So, so quickly. I brought the gospel to you, and now I hear so quickly after I've left, you are turning away to another gospel. And he says, and you know what, there's really not any other gospel. There's only one, but you're turning to a distortion of the gospel. So quickly after I've left, I so quickly have to write to you and correct your path. I'm astonished. And so right, this is, this is getting into, we're now out of the introduction, and we're now into what I call the initial rebuke. 
here. He's setting the stage for what he's going to try to accomplish for the purpose of his letter here. But then in, uh, in verses 8 through 9, he continues this, what I call initial rebuke. He says, even if we or an angel from heaven, and that should not say prese, it should say preach. It's a typo on my part. Even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to one you received, let him be accursed. So verses 8 through 9, uh, verses 8 and 9 almost say the exact same thing. He says, if, I don't care who comes to you, if he's teaching you something differently from what we originally taught you, let him be accursed. And you know what? I said it once, and I'm going to say it even again. To reemphasize my point and to show you how much I care about this, let him be accursed, anyone who would come and try to teach you a different gospel from what we had preached here. In other words, do not, under any circumstances, let anyone, whether it be an angel or a demon or me, come in and tell you anything differently from the first things we told you. Because that was the gospel truth. Anything else is not. And so he's, he's very concerned about this here. The one I preached to you in the beginning, the one, the, the gospel we brought to you when you became Christians, when you received the gospel, that was the only one. Anything that deviates from that, you need to stay away from. And so very quickly, uh, the Galatians, who are the intended audience for this letter, they're reading this letter, they, uh, they know exactly what's up. They know exactly why he's writing this letter. And uh, well, we, we messed up. That stuff that those guys came and told us was really important that we should now start doing this stuff. Apparently, the guy who showed us how to be Christians in the very first place told us where we've goofed. So this is the introduction. I said verses 1 through 9 in the first chapter are the opening to the book. And that was it. That was the opening. By the way, I want to say, um, most of you have either read Galatians at least once in the past or have read Galatians in like the last couple weeks um, as we've been going through this stuff. Any kind of uh, question that you've had as we go in that I don't address directly or thought that you might have, I really like to have that kind of input and so on and so forth. I like that kind of discussion. So feel free to throw out anything or ask any questions. Um, we're not on any kind of uh, terrible time crush. We can take our time through the book of Galatians. But with the opening here, this is the, we, we are now done with the first major section of the book. Any questions? Once again, straightforward. You know, nothing's, yeah. nothing's too weird, nothing's too confusing. Um, we, we shouldn't be any, uh, in, in any big trouble yet. Are you guys ready to move on to the first major section? Yes. Yes. What is the gospel that Paul preached specifically? Like, I'm really curious to know exactly what his gospel is defined specifically as. What are the parameters of his gospel? Well, that's a, that's a very broad question. Yes, but I've had like a debate for years with someone, you know, about who Jesus is. And so this verse could be a definitive mm -hmm. or it could be wrong. Sure. Uh, the Galatian churches that he's writing this letter to, you can read more about them in Acts. And we did a little bit of discussion about this mm -hmm. um, prior to going into it. But in Acts uh, chapters 13 and 14, mm -hmm. when Paul and Barnabas went on a missionary journey to spread the gospel uh, in areas further away from Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. so you had the early church, and it was mostly the Christians. The Christian movement was only around Jerusalem, I and mean, a bit to the north as well. But they went off. They went to Crete, this island. They went further um, west mm -hmm. with the gospel. And Galatia was this big Roman province that they went to. And so uh, what you can do is actually, and I think starting near the end of 13, or starting in the latter half of 13, and then in chapter 14, uh, you can read literally when Paul and Barnabas showed up to these cities in Galatia, what happened. And you can read the message they preached to them. Uh, you, they literally have recorded uh, the words that Paul spoke to these guys because he stood there and he spoke this message where the Jews got really angry about it because he was speaking to the Gentiles. That's us. Anybody who's not a Jew is a Gentile. And Paul and Barnabas were freely teaching the gospel to the Gentiles. 
And so you see exactly what he said. And the bottom line was, when he would go to the Jews, he would say something along the lines of, okay, the Messiah in the Old Testament was Jesus Christ, that man that you killed. Mm -hmm. You goofed up. Mm -hmm. And so the things that Jesus said, the things that he did, you guys missed the point. But I'm not telling you, it's not too late. You can actually turn your faith to Jesus as the new movement of what God is doing and then follow in his footsteps. Become a follower of Christ. It's a Christian means little Christ. Mm -hmm. To the Gentiles, it took a very different twist. Uh, Paul would adapt the way he would approach uh, preaching the gospel depending on who it was. So for the Jews, it would always be going back to the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. For the Gentiles, uh, and probably the best example of the way he would speak to the Gentiles would, uh, would be seen on Mars Hill in Acts chapter 18, I think it is, the second missionary journey, when he was uh, around Athens. And he went and he spoke to all these philosophers, and he's giving them, basically playing by their rules and their philosophy, and trying to show them how their philosophies are flawed, and show them how uh, the, the Christian movement with the, uh, well, the Judeo-Christian God, the God of the Jews, fulfilled in Jesus Christ, is the, uh, the correct way to life, I guess. And so, once again, it's a broad question as far as what is Paul's gospel, because Paul's gospel would be you know, oh. the Christian gospel. It's all of that. There's a lot more to that, even. Um, in terms of... I did narrow down my question a bit. Okay. I just wasn't trying to open a can of worms no, in here, fine. but I specifically would like to know, is there a place in the Bible where Paul specifically addresses the identity of Jesus as God, mm -hmm. and he addresses, he calls him God. Yeah, yeah, there are, it's all over the place. Um, I know it's in other places. I know I've studied this out. It's in Isaiah. It's in John. It's in Revel. It's in other places. But, but Paul, specifically, Paul specifically, for the sake of Colossians chapter one and verse gospel. fifteen, okay. he says Jesus Christ is the image of the invisible God. Image of see, okay, that's the camera. But, like, I, I believe that Jesus is God. He's this, looking for proof. Uh, yes. Or in, proof, yeah. In, indisputable, in his, untwistable, his can't, can't make it mean something else. Yeah. Like, yeah. That's interesting. I've never, I don't think I've ever encountered somebody debating that Paul didn't believe Jesus was God. Mm. Um, his whole conversion experience was based on that fact, because it wasn't God that appeared to him. This is it. I didn't want to necessarily... Oh, it's fine. Teach. It's an interesting discussion. I think it's worth discussing. I'm not what you're teaching tonight. It's um, just a very good opportunity for me to maybe obtain some clarification or insight from someone more learned, but I specifically have studied the scriptures just to answer this person, and he's very learned as well, which makes it very difficult because he believes in the Bible. He believes in God. He believes in Jesus. He just denies that Jesus is God. He says that Jesus is the Son of God and not God in the flesh. And that's the camera. I wasn't necessarily trying to make it an issue for anyone else's days, but for me personally, like I'm still trying to irrefutably resolve this. And if you have any insight, I would be grateful for it. Yeah. Um, regarding your friend's stance, does he believe that... He teaches another gospel. This is like where I come from with him. Like I'm like, you're teaching another gospel. Yeah. I don't talk to him. Now, so it, it seems like it might be a question about the Trinity. Do you know what he believes about the Trinity? Yeah. Because obviously there's there's God the Father. Yeah. And there's God the Son. Yeah. And there's the Holy Spirit. Yeah. So they're obviously distinct, but not distinct. Yeah. Th does he believe that Jesus is um, not divine? He Would that be the... He is the first begotten Son. Oh, okay. And not... Not, um, the firstborn. Okay. That's in Colossians Not as well. Not the creator, but the created. Created. I believe that Jesus Christ created mm -hmm. the world, and then he also inhabited it. He definitely disputes would dispute that point. He believes it is yeah. So I, it's just very interesting and complex, and I maybe you know shouldn't even have brought this up. It's just it's so fresh for me and. You're teaching on this tonight, and we just happened upon this 
study and yeah. so I'm sorry if I distracted anything. Well, I just thought it would be worth asking you mm-hmm. what you had to say on the matter as well, far as what his gospel is. Going beyond was. Paul then, uh, the single place where it's, it's I've never found someone who could deny that John. Jesus Christ said that he was uh, God. I am before Abraham I am. Yes, you got it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, he, he denied. It's interesting, yeah. The, the Aramaic language is pretty hard to, because for the Jews, and Jesus was a Jew, I'll, I'll, I'll just give you guys the, the quick background here. Uh, Jesus was a Jew, and he was born as a Jew. And so for the Jews, there were particular uh, things that you could say or could not say. Right. For instance, the name of God wasn't spoken aloud. You didn't say it. Um, so there, there are some things that you, you say, and there are some things that if you said those things, you would be killed. Um, you'd be stoned, which is why... When Jesus said these things, they tried to stone him, and he escaped. He went invisible or something. He got out of there somehow from his hometown, actually. The bottom line is, uh, he said, uh, referring to Moses and the law, and they were debating him back and forth about, wait, would you go, you know, would you try to circumvent Moses and the law? Would you try to go above Moses and the law, you rabbi? And he said, before Moses was, I am. And then I am, you guys know, going all the way back to Moses, right. when Moses has the experience with the burning bush. Uh, that was the language that God used to refer to himself. Yes. Right. I am. And so it was sacred language and no Jew would utter, yes. or they would be killed. Which is why when Jesus uttered it, it says, the crowd then flew into a rage yeah. and sought to kill him, but they couldn't. They could not lay a hand on him, because it was not his appointed time. Right. Um, so there you have to say, either Jesus was clearly a heretic who was definitely not related to God's plan. So he was a, a bad man. Or he was what he said he was. Yes. Yeah, so so that, that, one's, that one's pretty difficult. You would think it would be that cut and dry. I just wondered if Paul ever came out and spelled it out and said it in any place that, what his position was. Yeah, it's interesting. I've never looked for one because I've just never, I've never heard it that. I've never encountered that particular argument. But I'm, I'm pretty darn confident that it wouldn't be difficult because most of the people, I have encountered it from Muslims who will say Jesus was a prophet, he wasn't God, and he never claimed to be God. Mm-hmm. Which is why the I am verses, that's the best one there because yes. for them you, that's very difficult and, to deny. And because, in Revelation, Jesus speaking says I am now. Right. But so for most of the people who would deny uh, that Christ said he was God, they wouldn't care about Paul or Peter or John or any of those. It doesn't matter because they were crazy people who thought he was God and they were wrong. Right. Um, so it, I've never actually looked for it in Paul or made note of it. Challenge. But uh, yeah, that, that's interesting. We had a Foundations uh, Facebook group. I, I, that's how I Oh, great. Promise. Yeah, we have, a, we have a group where we're able to post any discussions or questions. Mm-hmm. Well, what I can do is, because it won't take me more than, more than a few minutes once the class is over, but I can just do a little bit of research and reading to see or find the places in which Paul made explicit statements. Um, yeah. And I can stick it up on there. That would be great. For, sure. Uh, thank you for any insight you have. Absolutely. Insight. It's an interesting question, and uh, you know, apparently yes. it's worthwhile because there's yes. people who have those mm-hmm. exact problems. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. Thank you for your question. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you for answering. Mm-hmm. So hopping back right over here. We had just reached the end of our opening segment. Okay, This is his opener to the Galatians. And finally, we start moving into the meat. So he had the initial rebuke. I can't believe you turned so quickly. I don't care who it was that told you. You should not be turning away from the gospel I gave you in the first place. And here we start. Now, and this is a really interesting little section right here at the beginning. We have three verses, 10, 11, and 12, in which Paul makes an interesting point. And then we have another, say, 15 verses. Yeah, exactly 15. Wow. 15 verses in which you're like, what is he doing? Like, why is he bothering to say this? But these three verses are going to give us a uh, kind of our, our hint, our key to understanding those. So he says, for, for am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. For I would have you know, brothers, that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it, but I received it through a revelation 
of Jesus Christ. Now, obviously, we're referring here to his, you know, his, his conversion experience and his relationship with Christ after that. But uh, he says, well, you know, what, what, is it, what is his point here? He's talking to the Galatians. He just said he's rebuking them for turning away from the gospel that they had heard from these other people. And now why does he say this? Because this was another gospel that they were speaking, and, and the one that Paul spoke was not made up. It was given to them by, by Jesus Christ. Yeah. Um, he says, I'm not trying to please men. I'm not coming to you with some man-made thing. Mind isn't just one in a list of opinions. What I'm giving to you is what was given to me by God. In other words, this isn't like, well, here's Paul's gospel, and here's the Judaizer's gospel, and which one should we choose? He's saying, well, there's the Judaizer's gospel, and then there's God's gospel. So which one do you choose? And it's a pretty clear line kind of drawn in the sand there. I would have you know that the gospel that was preached by me is not man's gospel. I received it from God. Strong words, pretty quickly. Saying, I'm serving God in what I do. I was serving God in what I do. I was serving God when I brought you the gospel. And that very gospel is the gospel that God gave to me to give to you. Uh, so this is, this is a defense of the gospel that he taught them. Okay? He's saying, okay, yes, there's this new opinion, but I want you to know that the gospel that I taught you was the one. I mean, you can't just turn away from that willy-nilly. That is the one. This is the gospel. So we have the Judaizers showing up saying Paul's gospel is not enough, that he left out some important things. And Paul's saying, yes, it is enough. Because my gospel is the one that comes directly from Christ. So that's what he's saying here, okay? It is flowing very clearly and very directly from the last thing he said. Which, interestingly enough, you'll find that if you work hard enough to understand it, that's basically how every epistle works. It's point flowing after point. And they usually make sense. Very rarely do you have a complete one verse to another, a total change. Unless a point is completely over, and then there's a clear change of tone to another point. Mm -hmm. But usually, you, you can see a transition. You can see him building towards a point. He's, he's actually working towards something. And it's a bummer, because a lot of people don't read the Bible like that. They read it as like a bunch of one-liners. Okay, what does this mean? Oh, that's just fun. This is a cool statement. And they'll build their theology off of pulling one verse or one section of verses out and making a conclusion about that. When in reality, it's a whole letter. You have to read it in this, the context of the verses before it and after it and the whole letter, the chapters before it and after it and so on and so forth. And so at this point he does something weird. First of all, any questions here? Any confusion? Usually, I know when sometimes I'll read over something and I'll go, wait a minute, what in the world? Like, why is he suddenly talking about these things? And then the connection will click. And you go, oh, well, of course, it all makes sense after that. Um, hopefully, as I, I help give you guys at least some of my opinion as to the flow of this letter, things start to click a little bit, if you are having any problems at all. But after this, he, he does something kind of interesting. And it's a little bit confusing, at least at first. He launches into his own history here. He starts talking about himself. Um, and this is going to go all the way from verse 13 to the end of the chapter, in verse 24. And then he kind of even continues that, especially for verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2, and then even a little bit uh, all the way to the end of chapter 2. But especially right here, he's going into his own history. And we'll see what he's doing here in just a moment. But he says, for I, you have heard of my former life, in, former life in Judaism, how I persecuted the church violently and tried to destroy it. And I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people. So extremely zealous was I for the traditions of my fathers. Now, upon, upon first glance, what is the connection between verse 13 and what he just finished saying in verse 12? Oh, that he, he was... Um he did hold the traditions very high, and that, that was something that was learned by tradition, by being passed down. <coughs> yeah. Yeah. And, and but, but he hadn't mentioned any of his traditions up to that point. That's true. He hadn't gone into the, the old Jewish law. He had really just, mm -hmm. he was talking about the gospel, saying, my gospel is the gospel given by God. Yeah. 
And then suddenly he says, and let me tell you about my old life. I used to, you, know, I, you guys know I used to be a really zealous Jew. and I was persecuting the church. And, I, and he goes, and I was really advanced in Judaism. And I was advancing really quickly. He was a prodigy mm -hmm. of sorts. Just so a, if anyone, you, you would think that if that was special revelation, I would be saying the same thing these guys are saying, but I'm not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be really good. That might, might, be, I mean, might be a really good perspective. So we'll see as he goes on here. He's still talking about his old life. But when he who had set me apart before I was born and who called me by his grace was pleased to reveal his son to me in order that I might preach, to, uh, preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. What is he saying? I was a Jew. I was very zealous. I used to persecute the church. I was a prodigy. But when he, who's the he? God. Oh, God. When God, who had had a plan for me, called me by his grace, revealed Jesus to me. So this is when he's on the road to Damascus. Jesus shows up. There he is. And Paul realizes the truth. When God revealed Jesus to me, in order that I might preach him, and I don't care which him you want to decide this is, whether it's God or Jesus. It makes no difference to me. In order that I preach him among the Gentiles, I did not immediately consult with anyone. And here we go. Like which of these point, which of these random facts is relevant? Which of these is not as relevant? Mm -hmm. Who knows yet? But so he's still talking about his past life, right? Yeah. Can you find any kind of like major? Okay, clearly, he's talking about the gospel here. Sort of. It's kind of hard to see the connection between the, the last few verses. He's saying. I'm not preaching man's gospel, I'm preaching God's gospel. God set me apart and, and showed me that I, you know, he, yes, he called me to preach. And I didn't consult with anybody. Who knows why he's saying that? We will, in a minute. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went away into Arabia and I returned again to Damascus. Then after three years, I went up to Jerusalem to visit Cephas and remained with him 15 days. Once again, we just have a lot of seemingly random information about his past. Who cares where he was at for so long? Who cares how many days he went to visit Cephas in Jerusalem? And who was Cephas anyways? Peter. Peter. That's right. Cephas is Peter. And Paul, for some reason, will go back and forth between calling him Cephas and Petros. Mm -hmm. I don't know why he does this. Mm -hmm. he just, maybe it's for spice of life. Mm -hmm. Variety, you know. But yeah, so he's just going on and on about, okay, I was converted and I didn't go to Jerusalem. But he, he did. After he was smuggled out of Damascus, he went off into Arabia for an extended period of time and then to Damascus. And it wasn't until three years that we hear from him again when he finally comes to Jerusalem. And apparently he was only there for 15 days. So seemingly we still have more random information. And I saw none of the other apostles except James, the Lord's brother. This guy's the author of James, by the way. In what I am writing to you before God, I do not lie. Then I went into the regions of Syria and Sicilia. By the way, this is uh, Antioch and Tarsus, those areas up there. Okay. So once again, first of all, why is he so adamantly saying this? I'm not lying. No, seriously. What I'm saying is true. You think that he was making some kind of major point, but really he just said, and then I, then I went to Jerusalem and I was there for 15 days and I didn't even see any of the apostles except for Peter and James. I'm, I swear, I swear, I'm not lying. Is it because you didn't want them to think you got the gospel from somewhere? Yeah, I think it is. Okay. Yeah, I, I, I think you guys have hit the nail on the head. It seems like he's just railing, railing on and on and on about all this stuff. But we're getting to the end here. Let's go ahead and finish out. He went uh, up north to Syria and Sicilia, and he says, I was still unknown in person to the churches of Judea that are in Christ. In other words, he still wasn't like a big figure. He wasn't really well known. And they were only hearing it said, he who used to persecute us is now preaching the faith he once tried to destroy, and they glorified God because of me. In other words, hey, remember that guy who was trying to kill all of us? Well, he's a Christian now, and he's preaching. Oh, okay, cool. But he wasn't known by name. He wasn't known as like Paul, the leader of the church. He was just some guy. Okay. And so he was up north 
in Tarsus and uh, doing ministry in Antioch for an extended period of time up there for a long time, very long time. And finally, let's move on into this last little section. After 14 years of being up there in Tarsus and Antioch doing ministry, I went, up, or I went up again. They always say up to Jerusalem. I went up to Jerusalem, even when they were going south. I don't know. I don't know why. But they always did it. Always. You see it all through Acts, and it's annoying. Because I'm like, oh my gosh, is there a, you know, am I confused? Is there another Tarsus down south? Or Anyway. I went up again to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus along with me. I went up because of a revelation and, uh, and set before them, though privately, before those who seemed influential, the gospel that I proclaim among the Gentiles in order to make sure I was not running or had not run in vain. And that's going to cap off this little kind of long, here's the beginning of my salvation, and here's, you know, coming up to this certain point where I came back to Jerusalem. And it's very, it's a long section. You're looking at 20 verses or so. It just goes on and on and on and on. And why is he saying this? And uh, Megan and Kim, I think you guys are spot on. Because remember, let's go way back here. Way back, go back, go all the way. Right here. Remember, he rebukes them for turning from the gospel, turning from the gospel he taught them. And he says, I'm not seeking the approval of man. I'm not trying to please man. Uh, you guys need to know that the gospel preached from me is not men's gospel. I did not receive it from any man, nor was I taught it. The gospel that I taught to you, I received completely from Christ. So in other words, here's a question. When you have a new Christian, okay, a new convert, somebody takes them under their wing and disciples them teaches them how to do stuff, and then eventually they graduate into like ministering and preaching. Who taught Paul? Jesus. Yeah. yeah. Nobody did, in other words. <laughs> he immediately, and you see this in Acts chapter 9, he was converted, he accepted Christ, and it's like the next day he went to the synagogues and started preaching. Because Christ gave him the gospel and told him what... I, and we don't hear any kind of super in-depth uh, explanation of, I mean, we have the moment where he says, go to Damascus, you've been persecuting me, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But suddenly Paul emerges having extremely well-developed theology in terms of a theology of Christ and a theology of Scripture, a theology of the atonement, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, okay? So it, it seems to me that if he's, he's talking about all this stuff, there had to have been further revelation he had from Christ mm -hmm. at various points. Perhaps from the three years where he went to Arabia and he was gone for a long time and then suddenly he shows up and he's a genius and he knows everything about Christianity. I don't know. But this is what he says. I did not receive it from any man. I was not taught it by anybody. And then he goes on. You've heard of my former life. I, was, I persecuted these guys and God called me and he showed me. But he says, I did not consult anyone. I wasn't taught by anyone. They didn't take me under their wing and show me how to teach things. They didn't teach me how to teach the gospel. He says, I did not go to Jerusalem, which is where the church is located, where the church is focused. I did not go to those apostles before me, but I went away, and I was gone. When I did go to Jerusalem, I was only there for 15 days. I only saw Peter. And then he saw James as well. I didn't see any other, other apostles. And he says, and what I'm writing to you before God, I do not lie. So what is he emphasizing? The fact that he didn't sit down and have lunch with the apostles who explained to him in detail the gospel. He didn't sit and you know, chat with them up and get all this stuff. He's like, I'm not lying to you. I didn't get it from anyone. Yeah. That's important, though, for, from his perspective, because the, um, the other apostles, Peter and so on, they had a, a firsthand experience with Christ. So he's identifying himself. I had that firsthand experience. Yeah. With Christ also. Yeah. That's where I got mine, mm -hmm. not from Peter. Or and he talks about this in a, at another point as well. Yeah. Like he, he basically says, I'm on level with these guys. Not like yeah. a pride thing, but he says, I have, I have everybody as much authority because all the information I got, just like they got it all from Christ, so did I. He's very unique in this respect, Paul is. Mm -hmm. He's not like a, a third generation Christian. You could call him a first generation Christian because he had the experience with Christ, had the revelation of all the truth that these guys got, another point, after Christ was gone. Yeah. It's pretty cool. Yeah. 
Right. Yeah. But so he did see James and Peter then? He saw James, the brother of uh, Christ, and Peter. Yeah. So, like, you really just have to believe him when he says that they didn't, like, teach him the gospel. Yeah, but he does make a mention of saying that he was there for 15 days. And so the, the time that he spent with the churches in Galatia and the kind of, like, the level of development of the gospel is something that would take a long, a lot of learning in order to get a hold of, which is why people, you know, today study his letters nuts. I mean, you can take, you can literally spend years studying Romans and not understand all of it. I mean, it, it's, it's, and obviously there's now the differences between language and we have cultural gaps and so on and so forth. But bottom line is, people study theology like all their lives, okay? The level of sophistication that he brought to them with the gospel isn't something that you can get over coffee. You know what I mean? Right. Which is why we have these classes every week. And I teach these classes, and I can not even say I'm anywhere close to having a fully developed theology. Because Christ hasn't shown up to me and said, Nate, here's the gospel, you know? None of it, oh, unless, one, unless one of you have had that. And I would be dubious if you said you had it. <laughs> it's, it's hard to, you know, credit that, but yeah. One more question. Um, so when he was persecuting Christians, like, did he not know anything about the gospel then either? Uh, he believed, like many Jews believed, that Jesus was a heretic who claimed to be God. And any Jew that claims to be God is crazy. And they killed the heretics. And the Christian movement was a bunch of people who were claiming now that Jesus really was God and that he was raised from the dead and that they were a dangerous sect that needed to be exterminated. That was what he knew. So like he just he didn't know like all the details of exactly what happened? No. Now, I don't think that he went from like 100% hatred of Christianity to 100% loving it uh, because he was there when Stephen was martyred. Stephen was the first martyr in the history of Christianity. And don't say that Jesus was because Jesus was not a Christian. It's weird to think about. But Christian means follower of Christ. So. Yeah, Stephen was the first martyr. So the church got, ro uh, got rolling and Stephen was ministering to the Jews and they, he basically called them out saying, you murdered the Messiah. You ruined all the good stuff here. You guys are at fault. You are always the ones who are murdering God's messengers. And they freaked out and stoned him. And uh, Paul was there. He watched it happen. Um, and he mentions at another point in the New Testament that watching it happen had an effect on him. And so I almost, and this is conjecture, of course, but I almost like to think that he was passionately attacking the Christians to almost drown out the doubts that he had in his own head. Hmm. And then suddenly, because you've got to wonder, people don't work black and white. No. You know what I mean? And you have this guy who seems to be totally black against Christianity. And then in one super quick moment, he's suddenly completely white. He's completely for it. And he's preaching and he's like Superman. Uh, I think that God had been working on his heart for a long time. Hmm. And that he was, God doesn't just say, okay, now we'll send a vision to him. I think when God does something like that, it's because it is at the perfect moment when he says your heart is right where it's at, right here. Boom. Which is why you see Paul became possibly the most influential man in the history of Christianity in terms of spreading the gospel. Possibly. Because uh, I think God said, man, he's ripe. Let's do this. Um, so yes, I think he knew somewhat of, uh, some, a bit about Christianity, but certainly nowhere near what he knew after Christ gave him the revelation of the gospel. Because there's a lot that goes into that in terms of who Christ is and his relation to God. And Paul, Paul has the most developed and uh, developed and complicated and well thought out Christian theology in the entire Bible. There's really nobody who comes close to laying out the nature of God and the nature of Christ and the nature of salvation and the nature of the Christian life and the atonement and sin and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, like Paul does. And I don't think that was necessarily just because he was a superhero genius. He didn't have a Bible to pull from like we do. 
I think, I think Christ was feeding him, mm. which is why he can speak so confidently. Mm. Um, so yeah, I think this is why he's so adamant. He's saying, look, I, I'm, I'm not spouting off to you the things that have been spoken by other men here. I'm not parroting what I've heard. I'm telling you the gospel of God. Um, and he finally says here, after 14 years of being gone, and, and this is 14 years of doing ministry, mostly up in Antioch, which is where he met Barnabas. Um, he went back to Jerusalem with Barnabas, taking Titus with me. By the way, who was Titus? A disciple of Paul's. So all the words you just said. Um, disciple of Paul's. Uh, he, was he a Jew? He was a Gentile. He was a Gentile. So interestingly enough, Titus was a Gentile convert before he ever went to Galatia. And apparently Paul was traveling with him. And you'll see in a moment here how there's this interesting moment where he introduces this Christian Gentile to the face of all the apostles and you get to see their reaction and what they decided to do with him in terms of circumcision. Um, but I named my firstborn son after Titus. Titus is that guy who Paul wrote the letter to. Oh. Titus. Um, and Titus, he was later over the entire church in Crete. And that's what the letter was about. Paul wrote him a letter basically trying to explain to him that Titus was having a very hard time and he wanted to leave. He said, I want to get out of here. I want to go back to Jerusalem or something. And Paul was telling him, you got to hold, hold strong. You've got a ministry there to do. I know it's hard. I know you're surrounded by all kinds of crazies. There were lots of magicians and pagan stuff happening in Crete. Because you've got to stay strong. We laid out to him all these principles of building a church, which is why Titus is a really cool book. Mm. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, he, he brought Titus along with him. And then it says he goes to Jerusalem because of a revelation that Christ gave him again. Go back to Jerusalem now. And he set before them, in other words, the apostles. Um, he privately set before them, to the people who were influential, the gospel that he had taught to the Gentiles. So in other words, this is the first place where he presents the gospel that he had already been teaching for years to the, to the leadership, basically. Saying, hey, by the way, I know you haven't given me, you know, sanctioned this, mm -hmm. but this is what I've been telling everybody. Mm -hmm. And so if Paul hadn't been giving a, given a revelation from Christ, this could have been really, like, scary. But Paul says, here's what I've been saying. In order to make sure that I was not goofing up, okay? In order to make sure that I wasn't teaching some kind of crazy false gospel. Mm -hmm. um, and bottom line, well, and we'll get there in a moment here, but as we're going to see, it was right in line with what the apostles believed. The apostles who had been with Christ and had mm -hmm. sat under Christ and heard him, it was right in line with what they believed. And he had never been taught by any other one. So that's what the point of that whole first section is. And we'll continue to be for the next a few verses after this, although he makes a slightly different point. But the bottom line is here, he's giving, he's making the defense of the gospel by one, giving it divine authority. In other words, the gospel I carry has the authority of God behind it. And so that's the first major section. And that takes us to the first chapter. And uh, the remainder of the second chapter is going to be sort of an extension of the point he's making here with a slight uh, deviation. He's going to go into what happened once he got to Jerusalem and interacting with the apostles and first encounters with the Judaizers and uh, so on and so forth. But we are already, uh, I took you guys 10 minutes over, so I apologize. Any questions? Okay. Uh, for next week, we're going to pick up right where we left off on verse 3, chapter 2. Um, especially now that we're in this stuff, yes. you guys have 100% access to everything that I'm reading. Okay, There it is, Galatians. So it's especially cool whenever you all come with questions or thoughts or like, I was thinking about this verse in relation to this and what is, you know, anything, anything like that. What does that mean? What is this? Whatever. That stuff's fun mm -hmm. and it helps you guys learn and grow and learn how to do your own research in the future, which is what this whole thing is all about. So, I encourage you, if you plan on being here next week, to read ahead. Uh, we'll probably, depending on how discussion goes, we can make it to the end of chapter 3. Um, so, we'll see. We'll see. Thanks, guys.